Jazz has never really been popular. So no, it's not it's not popular like uh like like funk was popular, like rock and roll is popular. It's not popular. It it is it it is a uh, uh it, it jazz is meaningful and is necessary. So those who are interested in that like jazz. Those who are not, they don't they don't like jazz. There's a lot of other things to like. We need to teach our kids about the music. It is a national art form. And I always make make the point, people say, what's going to be new in jazz? I say, people are going to listen to it. That's what's the new thing. Jazz is the music that's most in the world like conversation. Jazz is a music that, that, that prizes individuality. You have a lot of great individuals you can interface with. From Lester Young to Billy Holiday to Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock. You can name, just name musicians. You have great groups that you can love. They play in different forms. And you have the whole Afro-Latin form of jazz that, that takes you everywhere from Brazil to Cuba to Puerto Rico. It, 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 it integrates your citizenship and your understanding of the world. And mostly, and most importantly, it gives you tremendous pride in being America because we didn't have to denigrate or cut anybody down or do anything negative to anybody to create this. It's a non-predatory form. It's a symbiotic form. And you can be as rich as you want to be in jazz and nobody else has to be poor. I'm going to do this till I die if I can, if the, if the, the good law willing and, and, and people will have me. I've been, I've been blessed to do something kind of this abstract and get unbelievable support from people. Very, very grateful for how I've been treated by people all over this country of all kinds. No, when I was six, my father was playing with Al Hurt and Al Hurt gave me a trumpet for uh, my, my sixth birthday. So that's true. And my father later was talking to Miles Davis and said, I, I'm getting my son a trumpet. Before, before Al got me a trumpet, my father was talking to Miles. He was standing with Al and Miles said, don't get that boy a trumpet, it's too hard. So that is a true story. I grew up always wanting to play jazz. But jazz was is always much more difficult to learn in that time, especially than classical music. Uh, because my father's a jazz musician, I was always around the music. I was raised in the culture. I love the musicians. And my father was a, was, was a modern jazz musician. He, well, he wasn't playing New Orleans jazz. But at a certain time, when I was maybe 10 or 11, he started to play New Orleans music. And I also played in Danny Barker's Fairview Baptist Church Band, which was a New Orleans traditional band. Jazz... It was difficult at that time for a person my age and my generation to figure out what it was because it was not a part of the American mythology. Whereas with classical music, you had competitions and, 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 and classes you could go to so you could get a track record on your, on, your, on your resume. Like if you see, what did I do? It will say when I was 14, I won a competition to play the Haydn Trumpet Concerto with the New Orleans Philharmonic. But I was playing jazz the whole time. But what, what could I say that I did? I played in a club called Tyler's Beer Gardens on a, on a, on a Wednesday. It's a funny story about my father. He went to the Grammys. He, he he was not into those kind of things, and he sat through the whole show. And he was like, "Wow, you know, this is the Grammys." So at the end of the show, I won. I was in the back in the hotel with him and my mother. I was like, you know, getting ready to go out to the party or something. And I was I had my my I was like, "Yeah, man." My daddy looked at me and he he was wondering. He said, "Man," he said, "I'm glad that was the Grammys, huh?" He said, "Yeah, well, I'm glad you won. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. It's, it's great that you won." But you don't think this means you can play, do you? <laughs> so I started laughing because I was like 22. And I knew what he was saying because I still, of course, had a long way to go. Well, jazz is, is our national art form. And as such, it objectifies a lot of our basic principles. And uh, if a group of people are, are blessed to have an art form, which you can have a civilization and a, 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 a society, you may never create an art form that has that does that. It's a blessing. So America was blessed with a group of musicians and a social condition that produced this music. The, the music has three fundamental elements. Uh, the first is improvisation, which is our kind of individuality and what we, what we believe in. We have rights and freedoms and things that are about the individual. Then swing, which is about nurturing common ground, finding balance with other people, working out an agenda as you go along under the pressure of time. And then the blues. And the blues is an optimism that's not naive. So the blues also implies an acuity. That's, that's a democratic thing. Now, suffice to say that everything in the music ties into things that we do down to the three branches of government, like the rhythm section. Or, uh, what, to amend the Constitution is like adding to an arrangement. I could go on and on. And after a while of giving you these examples, you'll realize these are not superficial things that are contrived, that they actually come out of the American way of, of life. Now, to kind of give you, it's going to be a little longer answer, but it's important because 
the central question of jazz's position in our country concerns the relationship of slavery to the American identity and our mythology as a country. Black Americans, by and large, in our country have little or no knowledge of jazz. And uh, jazz is, is, is the greatest achievement of the Afro-American culture in the context of the American culture, meaning it's Afro-American, but it applies to all Americans, as many things in American culture apply to all Americans. Our poor public education system makes sure that a certain group remains ignorant. And the average white jazz writer is actually a rock fan who's for a long time wished that jazz would actually be something else without black folks at the core of it. Or that maybe jazz would just die away. That's why if you study jazz, there's a long-standing tradition of article after article and decade after decade saying, is jazz dead? That's probably one of the most questions that's been asked since the 1930s. Now, all of this investment and the destruction of jazz is to further obscure a big lie that jazz uncovers. And it's important to look at this because it's, it's, a serious, it's a serious thing to consider if we're to transform our nation. If we say our nation is based on human freedom and we're the first on earth founded uh, on the glorious celebration of human freedom, dignity, and rights, how do we then reconcile and correct the systemic dehumanizing ownership or brutalizing of a large underclass of people uh, for free labor because of their skin color? It's too much injustice to correct. So we're forced to say that those people are responsible for the problem. They're less than human and it's just their condition. But if they aren't, if it's not their condition, it means that our mythology and belief about ourselves is not true. Now, is Elvis going to not be the king? <laughs> Man, where you going to put jazz if Elvis is the king? It was, it's hard for, for later generations to understand uh, the challenges of an earlier generations. And, 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 and norms and, and, and things of show business and what Louis Armstrong did, it doesn't mean that necessarily even with my, I now I understand more of, of his genius and who he was and what he played, but it still doesn't mean that when I look at the movies he made or the positions he went, I still don't necessarily like that. I don't like a lot of where black people are in any of the American movies of the 1930s and 40s and, and 50s. And as a matter of fact, some of it now, a lot of it now, uh, that has that same type of, of, of destructive mythology if you consider the fact that when I was a teenager, the, uh, the heroic figure for black youth in movies were pimps. I mean, what is it for a pimp to be a hero or be at the top of your mythology? So, but to not get sidetracked with that, yeah, I thought that, but later I learned and understood who Louis Armstrong was as a musician. <laughs> That's a totally different story. That man was a genius of such magnitude, you can't even, you could lie about how great he was and you still wouldn't be saying enough. You know, I love Duke. And uh, Duke's intelligence, his dedication, over 2,000 pieces. And uh, I, I love him. And because I, I grew up also listening to classical music, I love Beethoven. The, the thing about Dizzy Gillespie hit me first was the depth of his intelligence. I met him when I was 14. And uh, just when he started talking, uh, when my daddy and other musicians listened to him, yeah, Dizzy was uh, very intelligent. He's part of the reason that we... we developed jazz at Lincoln Center because I didn't want to play in a big band because I had always grown up playing small band music. And Dizzy told me, I called him and asked him, man, what do you think I should do? He said, to lose one's orchestral heritage should not be considered an achievement. So he was telling me because you need to figure out how to keep our orchestral heritage. Uh, we, uh, uh, we paid a lot of dues to build up orchestral music and jazz and for us to just give it away and say the big band is old fashioned. That's, that's not intelligent.